When Galara Vincent was six years old, she walked in on her mum as she was slitting her wrists in attempted suicide. This is one of many childhood stories that she was drawn to heal and that inspired her book, which is released today. It's called Hammer, Sickle and Broom, a memoir of intergenerational trauma in Azerbaijan. And I'm delighted to share this conversation with you. It's a really profound and insightful discussion about culture, how it affects trauma and how finding an empowered context savvy story makes all the difference. So Galara is a mother of two, an energy healer, a writer, an associate university law lecturer. And using a variety of healing methods, she helps her clients to locate and dissipate the stuck energy of any trauma. And she's passionate about helping women create true connection in their relationships. To me, Galara is a friend. She's been a client of mine. She's an MPA fan and has done many of the courses that we've got. And she's going to be on the uh, MPA Master of Practitioners training, which, by the way, is open to um to be booked on today so make sure you check that out uh, and i'm very happy to share this discussion with you on the topic of the mastery if you go to www.thempaacademy.com slash mpa mastery if you're any kind of change worker facilitator uh, in the well-being space or transformational space maybe a coach then this is a program that is going to up level whatever you do. Yes, you're going to get a certification in MPA. You're going to get a suite of amazing tools beyond just MPA. Uh, the advanced version, I call them MPA frames. Um, but more than anything else, we're going to dive deep so that you can become the person that has the X factor in your client's eyes because you'll be able to, to learn and really embody what I like to call the resistance-free or the agendaless way, which makes your life so much easier because you don't get tied up in those subtle resistances and your sessions flow, you feel it, you feel the benefit, you get more energy, your clients feel it, they get the benefit, they get the energy. And and so you really, if you do this course, you're going to elevate yourself into one of the top one to four percent of facilitators on the entire planet. I'm stoked about it. Make sure you go and check that out. Again, it's www.thempaacademy.com slash MPA Mastery. Now, today's episode, again, we're talking about healing trauma. Galara is a great facilitator and um, I'm really excited to introduce you to her. Um, if you like this show, tell someone about it. I'd strongly encourage you to buy the book. If you go to the show notes for today, which are www.beabrillianthuman.com slash 85, you can find links to connect with Gulara and buy her book. All right, I think that's it. It's time to dive into it. So before we do that, hit it, Kim. Welcome to the Be A Brilliant Human podcast. You're in the right place if you're a growth-seeking being who acknowledges the challenges and delights of your humanity on the path to an ever more conscious life. If you want to feel inspired to love and accept yourself, to feel free to be and express you in all your brilliance, if you want to truly value yourself and others and feel energized and alive both at home and in the world, then sit back and take a breath as you explore and grow the brilliance of your beautiful human self with your host, the father of non-personal awareness and creator of the MPA process, Joel Young. Hello, Galara. Hello, Joel. <laughs> I'm so delighted to be speaking to you today. And it's an exciting day because today your book comes out and we've talked about your book. Um, for over quite a few years now uh, and we'll get to that um but tell me tell me about your book because i think that the subject matter of what you're talking about um is a really good sort of example of coming through um well trauma in a big way um to become what you are which is a brilliant human <laughs> thank you joe i i am thrilled to be here thank you so much for having me as a guest and the book is called Hammer, Sickle and Broom. It's a memoir of intergenerational trauma in Azerbaijan. And 
it's set against the backdrop of the Soviet Union's collapse. So there is a historic back, backdrop of the book, although it's not a history book. <laughs> it's more my personal experiences of big societal changes in that part of the world. Although the setting is quite unique, uh, the, the stories are universal. It's the stories of mother-daughter relationships and it spans three generations of women. Wow. I think one of the things that excites me about it is, is the backdrop because it's it's one of those things where you know if if you travel especially if you travel a lot you get exposed to different cultures and different ideas and you know just different ways of being which i think is a, a great sort of maturation process um you know rather than staying in a very local place i mean anyone i think listening to this podcast um, is a growth seeking being so there's a lot of inner exploration you can do but but exposing ourselves to different cultures. So um, one of the things I'm excited about with this book is, is because you get a very unique insight. You grew up, you know, in a place which is kind of shrouded in mystery and um, shrouded in, you know, political spin, <laughs> you know, um, that we don't get to see. And I think one of the things, because your book's not out yet, it's like I'm looking forward to reading it, one of the things I imagine you can tell me about this is that there'll be a, a real insight into what it was like living in that place. And my guess is, and you've lived in both cultures, so maybe we can talk about this, is, is how there's a universal principles about dealing with trauma that sort of trend, what can be informed by culture in how we meet it and yet transcend culture. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like the book is a unique window into the world that is, remains largely unknown in the West. And I, I brought a lot of essential detail. Like if you love food and Azerbaijan is big on its food, you're in for a treat. <laughs> and uh, also showing the places and the time uh, when I was growing up. Um, so it spans age six to 17. So it's quite a particular period and seeing that gradual disintegration of the Soviet Union, but also what we were led to believe in, because we were very much brainwashed. I remember from the kindergarten, my biggest aspiration in life was to see Lenin, in a, you know, the dead body of Lenin, because he was kept in Kremlin and you could go and see. Um, whereas gradually all the myths around how wonderful and amazing he was started to disintegrate and how the society has changed. It was a really turbulent period. Uh, in terms of trauma and how people approach trauma, I guess what I can see is that it was a lot of suppression, which meant that it just kept being rolled over and passed from one generation to another. So there wasn't, there weren't really tools in terms of dealing with trauma head on, but there were some cultural traditions, for example, when there was death in the family that was death was very much part of life right like you would experience death in the house and then there would be 40 day mourning ritual so there will be lots of people coming and crying and releasing some of their own trauma but also helping the host to deal with their own so that it's not bottled up more for women less for men in some ways and so I can see looking back that there were some mechanisms to release the trauma, but most of it stayed in, uh, which meant that there was quite a lot of violence in the family, like um, domestic violence was a norm, you know, like it wasn't shocking or surprising. I witnessed it, witnessed it myself. Um, so uh, in some ways, it's quite upsetting <laughs> looking yeah. back at, at what life um, they came for people because they were not able to deal with their own trauma. Yeah. I, I, so how did that, you know, as you look back now, because we, when we look back, we look back with a certain amount of hindsight. Um, but you experienced trauma in the book. You mentioned the book. It includes your, your experience with your mum mm -hmm. and a suicide. Um, so a lot of these different traumas, if you can sort of tell us a bit about, you know, how how you experienced it at the time, and then 
what was the point where you started to shift out of the impact of that into into going fuck this <laughs> i have yep. to do something right okay so um when i was six i witnessed my mom's attempt to so she attempted she slipped her wrists and i walked into that scene and that's where the book begins um so since obviously as a child you try to make sense of what's going on and as children we tend to take on the blame so i've done something wrong i'm not lovable she didn't want to stay for me um and so many other beliefs like one event had so many themes attached to it like i'm alone it's not safe to love people would abandon me like even if my mother can't stay for me then what <laughs> what hopes there is right um so i and i carried playing those patterns for many years until i moved to the uk and li literally stumbled across various healing practices because like life led me <laughs> life i thought that i would leave all that baggage behind i'll come to another country i'll have a fresh start and what i realized that i dragged all that baggage on my back <laughs> and even in a setting where I was reasonably free and happy. I still carried that pain, and I wasn't able to release that. So there came a point where the pain was so unbearable that I turned towards healing. I did Gestalt therapy, like a full-time job, for about four years, <laughs> uh, and it helped to talk about some of these things. But it wasn't until I came across MPA and Journey Method and Compassion Key that stuff really started shifting from my body, from my consciousness. And there have been many layers in terms of healing it. So I had to heal some of those beliefs so that I could open up to love. I had to um, heal layers of motherhood and relationship with your mother so that I could open up to my own children. Mm. So it's an ongoing process. I think my death wish would be to have a NPA <laughs> session. <laughs> <laughs> or equivalent <laughs> so it's not like i'm going to stop because the more you release the, there's more space for growth and that's what i love about mpa and other processes that i do yeah i think it, it it is fascinating how you know we drag our trauma around with us until we deal with it and that's then as, as you know in my view e even when you in quotes deal with it it still informs who you are in the world it's like it, it, it's like the formation of who we show up as in our personalities and in our life is often shaped by our life experience and our interpretation of our life experience and so as we as we go forward again my, my view is always that we're going to meet it again and again but there's a very different um subjective quality to it as you do all that healing work so it doesn't um it's not like you get lost or or defined by it um but the the gifts and the challenges that are inherent in our formative years are part of the the way that we meet the world going forward um so yeah and you mentioned mpa there <laughs> of course yeah so uh you know we we've, we've worked together one on one you've done the live courses you've done all the programs and you're actually coming on the practitioners training looking forward to that which is coming out um well it'll be live now i should think but <laughs> mm -hmm. look at our folks um and and other methods so if you were to sort of think about you know what's the one thing because all different modalities have their their flavors and the angles they look at and this is a very really tough question. It's like, what's your favorite record? This, <laughs> um, but if there's sort of one thing which has, has, has sort of touched you in a way that it's a driving force through your healing, like a, whether it's um, a sort of sacred idea that you have that has carried you through, or a, that kind of thing, what what would that be? Say, so, tricky question. Go. <laughs> it's not personal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, he's, he's been the game <laughs> that's been the game changer <laughs> because when i started writing the book i must admit there was a little bit of 
poor me. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent quite a and it took me quite a long time to edit and get the book out because I didn't want to come across as poor me. I wanted it to inspire and empower other women. So it was crucial for me to weed out any remnants of poor me. And so using MPA process and recognizing that it's not personal, it's really not, it was tough. But it, it wasn't because they were after me or out to get me or it wasn't, it really wasn't personal. And so getting that in my system, not just in my head, my whole being recognizing that set me free. Yeah, but it, it, it is, it's powerful. Obviously, I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah, so, it, yeah, and, and I'm kind of, I'm going to dig a bit deeper on that because it, we, we've already talked about, I mean, there's, there's I know from, because I know your story reasonably well, I, although I haven't yet read the book, I will when it comes out, but I know that there's been a lot of very strong, experiences which people would find very difficult to understand how can you possibly say these things are not personal it's like so what is what is your experience of that what what's your experience of of where you've come to and where you came from sure so uh, when i was little uh, one of the stories i was brought up on by my grandmother is that when i was born my dad stood over my crib and cursed me because I was a girl. Wow. Now, now, my parents were separated since I was two weeks old, so ne never had a chance to ask my dad personally, why would he do such a thing? And doing the MPA process, in, in some ways, removed that personal element, because I look back and I recognize that the culture is totally obsessed with boys. Absolutely, like there is a total obsession let me just give you an example of how obsessed. So when my son was born, I was treated like a national hero by my family. Okay. <laughs> my grandmother called his a Valentine's boy for the first two years of his life. My grandmother called every month on the 14th to say, happy birthday to him. Welcome to this world. And then my daughter was born. <laughs> and to date, she's six. My family seems to be unable to remember her birthday. Like, you know, they will call him the day before and they love her. They absolutely adore her. They love her even more. But there is something in the culture, like collective consciousness around prioritizing boys and somehow boys are more important or valuable. And when I look at, again, step back a bit further and look at the context in which boys are idolized, you know, are so important is Azerbaijan is sandwiched between Russia, Iran, um, there is Turkey, Georgia, and Armenia, but even the smaller neighbor, Armenia, waged a war against Azerbaijan. Uh, it's been resolved in the last few months, so there was a lot of publicity about Azerbaijani Armenian war um, late December, January um, this year. Mm. And I actually lived through the start of that war, and it is in the book, what my experience of it was. Uh, but long story short is that like, it needed to defend itself. It needed men in order to protect the land, in order to protect the women. It needed strong men so that we've been invaded left, right, and center over centuries <laughs> so that we can stand up for ourselves. So when you kind of zoom back, and don't take it personally. You can see that actually there are other pieces and it wasn't that he cursed me because it was me. Just, you know. And then many years later, um, what inspired actually writing this book was that I did quite a lot of therapy and there was this gaping uh, wound around my father. So eventually I thought, well, I'm just gonna, I haven't even seen his picture. I've never met him. Um, so I decided to travel to my hometown and find his graveyard and say goodbye. He died many years ago. So I traveled and my grandmother promised to help me and we couldn't find the grave. So I'm come, returning back um, to England and I went to buy my uh, ticket. And on the way back, I suddenly heard my mom's voice in my mind that 
he had a sister who lived in town center and her name is Parama. So um, I, I kind of for a moment stopped, paused. I thought, well, I haven't even thought of this. She told me when I was seven or something like that. So I went knocking on the doors, <laughs> looking for this woman I've never met. Wow. And eventually I found the right door, like half an hour, 40 minutes later. And she comes out and she looks at me and says, you look familiar, but I can't place you. Mm. And I said, well, I'm his daughter. I just, I just want his photo, nothing else. So she hugs me. She cries. She takes me into her house. And I walked into her 58th birthday. And there are 40 of my relatives. <gasps> and the amount of love I was showered, you know, like it was incredible. So I came back to England. And none of the stories I was told as a child made sense because from what she said, her side of the story was that there was actually quite a lot of love and attempts to reunite and all that. And so I started writing a book to make sense of what I was told and what went on in my life. And here we are with the final product out. It was a very long answer. <laughs> I forgot well, the question. <laughs> I'm really glad you shared the story because it's... Um... Because again, it, it speaks to sort of those universal truths. We're raised with stories, which in, in the case of a split, for example, or or, um, or if there's been a, a death of a parent, those kind of things, we only ever get the story from one side. And well, there's a couple of things. And then in we, were, we started off talking about your experience of finding it not mm -hmm. personal. And you, you brought up context. And I'm always a fan of saying there's no truth without context. And I love how in, in your healing process of, of that you were able to find a context where where you didn't take the story that you were told personally because when you did take it personally it had a very damaging impact on your sense of self um and also you know it raises because i know that you you particularly work with women you love to help women come through things and i imagine um in part my hallucination is that in part that's been informed by the fact that there was this um sort of vast difference in treatment of girls over boys in in your country which again we see across the world with you know the, the patriarchy and and you know as it's um seems to be slowly collapsing thank god <laughs> but nevertheless it's like it's, there are different levels of it that we experience um depending on well, depending on our experience, state the obvious, Joel, um, but depending on where we are, the culture we live in and those kind of things, there's, there's different things. So um, I guess I wonder if that informs it. And then uh, there's kind of two questions here. If that, if, if that experience informs who you work with, um, but also the, the, the story is wonderful because um, I talk a lot about busting the myths and, and your something inside you took you on that journey to find the truth about your father and it wasn't because you couldn't find his grave you know you couldn't speak to him directly or even do it the way you expected but in fact what happened through your willingness to follow your follow that inspiration and mpa we call it follow the animation um and and then it, it came to a point where you got even more than you expected by reconnecting with a larger number of your family and completely and experientially busting the myth of it so, yeah, so I think go back to the question that I asked there, which is, you know, is, is that really what informs you or is there something else that means that you love to work with women particularly? I don't mind working with men. And in fact, I had many amazing men I worked with. Uh, actually, I feel like men need this work even more in some ways because as women, we can channel some of the emotion, we can talk to girlfriends or there, there are some other ways I think, of processing, even though it doesn't necessarily release the trauma out of the body, but at least you can move some of that energy through talking, whereas for men, it's harder and tapping into the childhood trauma might be, um, you tell me, Joe, <laughs> <laughs> it might be harder. Um, but I, I've, I do quite a lot of group work where we go really deep, where we look at karmic imprints, ancestral wounds, where we look at uh, any womb imprints where some of these patterns 
are set in motion even before we were born. And part of difficulty of healing trauma is that it's preverbal, it's unconscious, it's deeply in the body, and we don't even know where it's coming from. So I do quite a lot of deep dive into parental wounds and things that impacted us even before we consciously realize, realize that. Because if you had some trauma later in life, you know the events, you can go and work through them. But what if there are things that happened even before you were born, which are influencing and impacting your life today? So I do quite a lot of that type of work. And it feels like somehow that segregation, gender segregation, uh, makes it safer for women to drop in. But um, one-to-one, I don't have any problem working with anybody. But for groups, I feel like it is important to have that holding. And I've done a lot of work around sexual trauma because that's something that, um, as women, we experience differently from men. So, therefore, it felt important to have that safer container for women. Yeah, I think that, that's that been my experience too, especially, like you say, in groups in particular. Mm-hmm. There's, um, you know, again, going back to context, I mean, I think in the in the general movement towards equality, there's been periods where, you know, segregation has been um, vilified. And to me, it's always about, well, what's what's the sponsoring thought behind it? Where the segregation is because you know, men are better than women is the idea, then yeah, sod off. <laughs> but there's actually, but but what often gets forgotten is is the beauty of, um, you know, gender exclusive meetings where there's a commonality of energy and a safety, um, which doesn't take away from, you know, mixed groups because but there is a different energetic dynamic. That's been my experience. And and so when um when women come together, there's a there's an energetic relaxing into the feminine, and and the authenticity of that, um, which avoids having to consciously look past the cultural inheritance of how women behave in the company of men and vice versa. So I think that's really valuable, and I think more and more now men um, are starting to gather in groups with the positive intent to heal, which I think is fantastic. Certainly compared to you know, 10 years ago or or definitely 20 years ago. Um, And I think that's really healing for, uh, as we work more in consciousness to come into healthy balance and mutual respect, I think it's, um, it's important. It's like, it's like, you know, you've got to work on yourself before you take it into the relationship. (laughs) Absolutely. And, Um, and there is value in having groups where there is, there are, mixed genders like uh, it, there is value in having men and women in the same room as well because it can bring up stuff that can be healed for both parties so you know i personally go to mixed groups and i get a lot of value out of them because it can trigger and push a button that brings stuff for healing um, but when you are doing already a very deep dive you don't need an extra trigger. There's already plenty to deal with. <laughs> so maybe with time, there will be a more inclusive container. But for now, it feels it's tender. It's tender and delicate. Work. Yeah. Again, I think we come back to that context thing. It's like um, each of those scenarios um, depends on the context and intent have tremendous value. And uh, part of it is being mindful of of what you're going into these things for and what you want to come away with from these experiences. So um, I can't let this interview go by without talking about law. Of course. (laughs) (laughs) Because you ended up going, becoming a, what's the, what's your official title in relation to law? Well, I'm currently an associate lecturer in law. You lecture. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go back to the thing. It says, um, Associate University Law Lecturer. Oh, my God. How did that happen? That's amazing. Well, well that's the end of the book. I will give it away a little bit. Um, but I got lucky because the Soviet Union collapsed by then and all the nepotism and bribery was taken out of equation for a very short while. It's back, I'm afraid, with vengeance. But 
when I was admitted, that was the first year when we had a written test examinations and I got very lucky and I got admitted to law because it was like absolutely inconceivable for anybody from my family background with the resources we had to go to university and study law. Like that in itself was an absolute miracle. And then I, I pursued my passion. I really enjoyed international law. So I did some more studying when I lived in Azerbaijan. And then I got British Council's Chipping Scholarship. Um, they usually fund one or two places per country in that post-Soviet bloc. And I was fully funded to come and do masters in European law because I fell in love with European law. Don't ask why. It just completely was <laughs> <Right>. smitten. <laughs> I was teaching it in Azerbaijan and I came and I wanted um, to do a specific course. I wanted to do external relations of the European Union because I intended to go back to Azerbaijan and that would have been useful and relevant to where I was coming from. Um, and so I chose, I had three choices. I could have gone to the LSE, uh, Birmingham or Glasgow and Birmingham offered the course I wanted. So I chose that course. <laughs> I ended in Birmingham. And then when I arrived, the tutor left to Bristol. <laughs> so that course never ran. <laughs> But I was very lucky to be at Birmingham. I loved the University of Birmingham. I did my PhD there and um, it takes me, it, it kind of feeds in my passion around giving voice to marginalized groups. So I did a PhD in minority rights and stayed on and taught for a number of years. It was only four and a half months ago that I left the university um, as a full-time job. I'm still associated with them, but law has been quite an important aspect. When you come from a lawless society, <laughs> learning and um, learning law was a privilege. I mean, it makes you feel a bit helpless that you can't necessarily always apply it correctly because the culture was very corrupted. But it it was very important in my own evolution and also giving voice to people who may never be heard otherwise has become passion that runs across everything I do because the book is about giving voice to women who may never be heard otherwise. Um, when I do my healing work, it's talking to the parts which were suppressed and silenced because it was too scary. And so giving voice to those parts and liberating them is um, very much part of who I am. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's interesting just hearing you talk about that part of your experience and what you, you help people with and suppression being, you know, part of um, your formative experience and therefore the longing is born to overcome and help other people overcome suppression. Um, interestingly, I think a couple of the recent podcasts I did, like um, last week, um, was last week about I forget right about I definitely did one on anger and suppression and also yes. keeping the lid on um th those two which I'll link in the show notes but uh and how it drains your energy when yes you how it really your... drains it takes so much energy to suppress within the human body but also I believe within society mm. um and and so it, it's kind of a it, it's a mechanism which is counter to our humanity you know suppression it's part of it inevitably but um, I love that you're you're so passionate about that, um, and so I kind of want to because the time's running away because I have such a lovely conversation. But if if you were there's two two questions I really want to answer or get, I want an answer from you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you um, before we bring it to a close. Um, the first one is so you know the listeners to this show. Um, maybe listening and going, you know, well, I actually, from hearing what Glara is saying, I can resonate with um, their own trauma, maybe not the same trauma, but, but recognizing that they have trauma. So, and I, I often offer my perspective, but I'd love for you to offer them, you know, if, if there was like, what's the secret to um, healing that trauma? What's, what's your advice, I guess? What would you say to them? I'd say meet yourself where you are right now. 
They come bypass and go digging. And sometimes the deeper layers come. But start with where you are. Like if you are frustrated, take that frustration somewhere into where you can unpack it and find the deep roots of that frustration because that frustration probably has been there for a very long time. So meet yourself where you are, but deal with the root causes of that trauma because frustration is just a symptom and there are deeper roots of why you are feeling a particular way. So a bit of both. <laughs> a bit of both. Yeah, well, I, I'm a fan of meeting yourself where you are. I think that's often the, the, the forgotten key. I think there's a lot of, um, it's easy when you come into the healing world to, to meet a lot of idealistic um, and even sort of, the, there are sort of unspoken shoulds, you know, you should do this or you should be in this place or whether it's be happy, positive, you know, you can't say negative things, the brain doesn't, all, all those kind of dogmas. Mm. <clears throat> but to me, in my years and years of healing, and I, I think this is what you're saying in your experience too, is that, you know, and, until you actually are willing to meet yourself where you are, it's very difficult to actually start moving from that place of power because where you are is is where the power is and it and it, it the, the the tricky bit about that for people often is that they are bogged down with ideas of where they think they should be and therefore think they are and it's humbling to their personalities it's quite can be quite crushing <laughs> I've done loads of work. I've done 10, 15 years of work. Oh, I hear and, that a yeah, lot. I've already done this stuff and it's something to yes. get actually. I've got nowhere with this this particular thing in this particular specific context. Um, I'm just scared, suppressed, frustrated, and in self-pity and blame. To yeah. admit that to ourselves mm. is is can be really tough. And I guess that's why I often say to people, you need, sometimes you really need support because you need to get some help because that's hard on your own. Absolutely. It's quite hard to see the patterns because you are in it, right? And it's hard to acknowledge sometimes what you are experiencing. What I see that people can resist going into healing trauma because they're like, oh, there's so much, or they imagine that they just need to go and unpack every event that happens in life. So there are different kind of... Um, myths around how to heal trauma. So it can be quite daunting if something significant happened to go and face it head on. So therefore, starting where you are, like what are you experiencing right now? Like that blame and self-pity and anger towards people can be a good entryway to something deeper because if you just think, okay, I'm just going to go and deal with my mom's attempted suicide or something, you will probably resist going there. You naturally don't want to revisit difficult places that you've been. You'd rather didn't live through them once, never mind going and working through them over and over again. Um, but there are different doorways. And I hear a lot of people saying, oh, I've done X number of years. And yes, those X number of years brought you here. <laughs> So if you want to go any further, then you need to dig deeper. Yeah, that's that's a really, really good point to make is that, you know, not to, like I use that example, I've done 10 years, 15 years, but everything that, that you've done before is always adding into the possibility, the readiness mm -hmm. of the next stage of the journey. So, yeah, it's fascinating. So, oh, my goodness. Uh, all right, so... Galara, I'm excited. So this podcast is going out on Tuesday, the 18th of May, 2021, which is the date that your book comes out on Kindle. Is that right? Yes, it's it's coming out on, on Kindle on 18th of May. <laughs> the day of, that you are listening to the podcast, fingers crossed that Amazon doesn't <laughs> do anything funky <laughs> and then a paper copy will come a week later so there will be a paper copy version as well fantastic it's called hammer sickle and broom a memoir of integrational trauma in Inter azerbaijan intergenerational trauma intergenerational sorry oh, schoolboy <laughs> error on the interview <laughs> well there's a, a lot of integration so <laughs> <laughs> it's partially generational trauma. trauma yeah which actually is a really important part of the whole 
the whole topic. So where can people find you? Where can they, is there like a website where they can, I will put links, I'll have links to um, where people can get hold of the book, uh, which I strongly encourage you to do. If you listen to this, if you resonate with Galara's story, just get hold of the book. Um, I think it's going to be an amazing read. Um, and, you know, it will support, you know, the movement of really getting these messages out to the world um, for what is, you know, the price of a couple of coffees, I imagine, for books. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and uh, so that'd be wonderful. So is there a website or somewhere people can go to find out about you? The, uh, the links will be on Amazon and I'm on socials. Do drop me a line. I'm on Instagram and Facebook. Um, just find me and I'd love to connect with you, especially if you have a look at the book and want to discuss anything, then please don't hesitate to reach out. Fantastic. So what's your handle on those wonderful platforms? Instagram, you are at? Gulara um, dash Vincent. Gulara dash Vincent on Instagram. Same on Facebook and those things? Um, if you just look for, luckily there aren't many Gulara Vincents. <laughs> Clara Vincent, search it. <laughs> I okay. think I'm one of the kind, so <laughs> it'll be easy to find me. Well, if I get, if you, if you, I'll find it, get the link and I'll stick it in the show notes as well. Right. So as ever, you can go to the show notes at www.beabrinkhuman.com slash the number of the episode, which for this one, I believe I should have looked this up before I said that sentence. I might edit it out. <laughs> if it's still here, I think we're at 85. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be there. All right. Well, Galara, thanks so much for being here and talking to us about your amazing story. Um, I'm really excited about your book coming out. I think it's going to be really um, enlightening read for anyone and anyone who's experienced sort of trauma, whatever the context is. I think it's always really good to get, you know, a, a sense of how other people have come through it. Um, to the point of, of sort of integration and success that you have. And uh, yeah, really, really cool. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Joel. I had so much fun talking to you.